happy Wednesday to everybody who is here. Thank you for taking time to join me today for this brief webinar on closing the cultural gap with the German speaking world. We have attendees from, I can see the list from across the world. So that is fantastic. Thank you for taking time out of your day. So I'll say, good morning or good evening or good day whatever time of day it is in your corner of the world um, welcome and thank you for being here my name is christian Höferle, and that would be the german pronunciation of my name um, i live in the english speaking world our company the culture mastery is located in atlanta georgia in the united states so most people around here call me christian and find one way or the other to pronounce my last name. Most of them work just fine. And if they don't work, uh, we'll give each other grace for, for not doing that. And I'm sure there are some of you on this call here whose last name I might struggle with at first. And that is the nature of intercultural interactions that we have to figure out how we best communicate with one another and how we address each other properly. So welcome, everybody. Let's get right into it. We'll take about 40, 45 minutes for the session, and it is being recorded, I hope. Let me double check. Yes, it is. So we will have a recording of the session afterwards that I'll be able to share with you. And those of you who registered and were unfortunately unable to attend, rest assured, we will have a recording of this for you to look at and listen to. So you're here because apparently you're interested in German speaking cultures, and I am using the plural, I'm saying cultures, not culture as a singular. Uh, the German speaking world is not only Germany, it includes all of Austria, the neighbor of Germany to the southeast, it includes a significant portion of Switzerland that is German speaking, it includes a tiny country nestled between Austria and Switzerland called Liechtenstein. You see the, the blue and red flag icon here on the bottom. It also includes Luxembourg, which speaks a, um, a certain dialect slash accent of German. And it also includes a tiny portion of Eastern Belgium, where German is also a recognized official language. Total in the world, there is some 120, some maybe even more than 120 million, maybe 140 million native speakers of German. And there is not one uniform culture that unites them. There is the language and the official structure of the language that guides thought processes and how we express our ideas, thoughts, emotions, and concerns. However, the cultures in the German speaking world can be a bit varied. So forgive me if I'm using German as synonymous for all of these cultures. We'll figure out the nuances in the other German speaking parts of the world as we go along. As you are engaging with the German speaking world, you probably have recognized that the behaviors and the actions and the communication styles of people from those parts of the world are different from yours. Whether the differences are significant or only minor, you very likely recognize that as you drive on that global freeway of work, that global freeway of exchange of goods, services, and um, human beings and professionals, that there are sometimes behaviors that are unfamiliar. Some of them might even be uncomfortable. And that's usually a result of the fact that some of these behaviors are unknown or unexplained as of yet. So we're trying to shed some light on this. So we have a brief time with each other. So in, in during that time, I want you to be able to identify what the main cultural values are of Germany as mainly compared to the United States, but also as compared to any other culture around the world. As we are located in, in the United States, that is often our main focus of work. And yet we do a lot of work with people from outside the United States as they interact with the German speaking world. Matter of fact, only less than an hour ago, there was a comment on LinkedIn advertising this session today where people were inquiring, hey, would this also be relevant to people from Africa who work with Germans? And of course it is. Not sure if we have participants 
from that part of the world. In any case, we are looking at German speaking cultures from the vantage point of outside of it and with a little bit of a heavy focus on, on North America. We also want you to understand how these cultural values affect how you show up in the world, how you communicate, how you build relationships, how you work with one another, how you lead and manage, or how you receive leadership from your bosses, from your colleagues, and how these cultural values and dynamics influence business practices and also bleed over into behavioral practices outside of work. And we're going to show you some tools and strategies how to make that work in your day-to-day. -day. Because, and this is a phrase that I borrowed from my daughter's English teacher, if you don't get it, it will get you. In this case, if you don't get culture, if you don't get in the sense of understand, develop a deeper understanding of culture and what it does to us, culture eventually will get you. It will beat you in, kick you in the proverbial behind. And that may be a unpleasant experience that is unsupportive to your professional or personal goals. Now, knowing that the chat function may cause you some challenges, let's see if we can use the Q and A function of a Zoom webinar. Let us know, let me know what is your biggest challenge right now as you are dealing with the German speaking world. Feel free to enter that in the Q&A box. And should you find yourself unable to do so, then again, my sincere apologies if technology has not been set up in a way that is conducive for this question. We still have a way for you to bring those questions to us via phone or email. Stay tuned till the end of the session and you will see our contact information, how we can do that. Because I really do want to know what is it that brings you into business or personal contact with German speaking cultures? And what are some of the challenges that you have been faced with or that you have maybe overcome and may be able to share some best practices for others? It usually isn't you, excuse me, it usually is not your company that is going global or acting in a global context. It is the people, it is the people that work for the company that work internationally. They are, the people are the ones that make the connections or don't make the connections. And if your people within your organization are not ready for or well-prepared and culturally savvy enough to be successful globally, then your company will suffer. So it's not necessarily the company it's the people inside the company that make or break international interaction. And how do we do that? What's the best way to be successful international? The secret sauce, so to say, the, the condiment that we should have is cultural competence. Cultural intelligence is another word that we often see in the literature. CQ is the acronym that's often used for cultural intelligence. You'll see in a second that we use a combined acronym. Um, Hang on for that. I have a question in the Q&A that I want to make sure that I don't miss. Um, somebody is asking, why do Germans compare everything to Germany? But in Germany, we do a different. Yes, that's a good question. And another question is that Germany I know may not exist any longer. I'm curious as to how the business culture has changed in the last 10 years or so. Also, what do German companies employees expect of their partners? Fantastic questions. We'll get to that. We may not be able to cover it in full depth today in this session, but if you stay till the end, you'll see how we can get those questions answered in depth. Thank you for that. So the secret sauce we covered. Now, when we look at other cultures, that is also, that's already addressing the first question we got in the Q&A. Why do Germans compare everything to Germany? Or more generally speaking, why do humans often compare that which is unfamiliar to that which is in their known zone, right? Or as others call it, the comfort zone. Because we don't see the world as it really is. We see the world through lenses, through our preconceived notions of what life is. Um, this is a quote by Anais Nin. If I want to be really technical, this is an old rabbinic quote going back to the time of... of, of uh, pre-Christianity and Judaism. Um, so we, humanity has known this for hundreds, if not thousands of years, 
that our experience of the world is limited. We have our filter systems and culture is one of these filter systems. And when Germans and Austrians and anybody in the world compares that which is new to them, they compare it to their default setting, right? They compare it to the factory setting, if you will, because that's what they know. And the unknown becomes that gets run across or against that um, benchmark. So whenever we compare cultures, we want to be aware that what we are comparing it to, we want to be aware of what is our own cultural setting, our predisposition. So before we can understand that which we don't know yet, it might be smart for us to discover who are we, what is our behavioral preference, how would we like to show up in the world, because that is not normal. And you see me, if you get my uh, camera feed, we are not normal. And I use the air quotation marks to put the word normal in, in air quotes as to say, normal is an arbitrary setting. What we consider to be normal may not be normal for other cultures. And just because it is normal to us doesn't mean it's a universal truth. It is the truth for us, right? And that might be the answer to, to your first question. Why is there so often a comparison? Because there is something that is unfamiliar and we try to find an answer. Our brain tries to fill in the gap. Um, you may have heard of the Sigarnik effect. That if, if we don't know the answer to something, our brain fills in the blank because we want closure. So we compare it to that which is normal to us. Sometimes that works. Very often it doesn't work. It only leads to more frustration because then we start to define right and wrong based on our cultural default and thereby ignoring the fact that maybe another cultural default is just as valid. So there's not one normal around the world, there's multiple normals and all of them have their validity within their context. So why does culture matter? Because culture impacts everything we do, the way we show up in the world. It affects how we introduce ourselves, the way I introduce myself, was probably guided by my Germanness and also by the fact that I've been living in the United States for 20 years of my life. If I lived somewhere else in the world, my introduction might have been slightly different. The introduction is also determined by the context in which we engage here. This is more of a monologue because I cannot hear you. This is a webinar format. So all of this affects culture, how we behave, right? It affects how we establish trust or we do not extend trust, how we communicate, how we give feedback, how we negotiate around conflict or pricing or um, a value proposition. So knowing what the cultural preference is of somebody will make or break our business success, right? If you're doing business with German speakers, not knowing what their cultural presets are will very likely inhibit your professional or personal success with people from that cultural area. And then there are the parts that we think we know, right? That, that's the green part of that, of that pie chart. We, we think we know a little bit about the culture we're doing business with, because after all, we did some research and we decided this is a market that's interesting to us. Of course, we know what we know. Fantastic. In learning something about another culture, we also realize there are still knowledge gaps. There are things that I don't know just yet. And those are the, the aspects of, of, of knowledge that we consciously want to fill, but we don't always see the full circle, right? We don't know what we don't know. There are things about other cultures that don't explain themselves automatically just by doing the research on our own, just by listening to others who have done the research before us, we still only get a limited experience and a limited exposure to that which we are trying to learn. Oftentimes, this orange reddish part of the pie is that's the blind spot that your rear view mirrors are not capturing. And this is usually what gets us in the proverbial butt, and it, the proverbial butt might actually be bitten by a nasty, dangerous animal that you see here. Because when we talk about culture, we want to be aware that there are two different, where well, there are many facets of culture, but there are two important ones to keep apart, those that we can notice easily, and those which are 
outside of our conscious um, awareness. So when I say noticeable, I you could see visible, you could also say that, and yet our sensory input, the way humans experience our environment is if we are able-bodied, um, we have five sensory inputs to compute our world. We can see, we can hear, we can touch, we can smell, we can taste, we got five senses. So we can notice a culture. We, that's what's above the water surface, the nostrils, the eyes of that animal. So this is the part of culture where you enter a place and you sense the speed at which people operate. You hear the sounds of that culture, mainly the language that people use to communicate the sounds that they make with one another, or maybe sometimes they don't make sounds. They communicate non-verbally. You can smell the smell in the air or the smell of food and beverages. You can taste those as well. You can see the architecture. You see how infrastructure is built, how signage is posted, how um, people stand close or not close to each other. Do they touch in a, I, I'm hesitant to say in a post-COVID era because do we know if this is already post-COVID? I certainly don't. But now that we've gone through two, three years of a pandemic almost, how do people interact with each other in space? How do they dress? Do they cover part of themselves, their faces? Do they cover the hair? Do they cover their faces? All of these are noticeable factors of culture. So we can quickly recognize people do this or they don't do that. And we pick up those, what we call surface level behaviors. This is usually in the realm of the do's and the don'ts. And you can memorize those, you can get an app for that and buy a book. Um, or whatever else you do to get the do's and the don'ts. And yet there is this bigger part of that animal that lives under that water surface. And that's where the more potentially dangerous parts of that animal live, right? You see that teeth and very muscular jaws and whatever else there is to, to be a threat to us. And this is what our sensory input does not detect just yet. We cannot see how people think. We cannot feel what philosophical principles they follow. We cannot smell or taste their value system, right? So this is all outside of our sensory perception. This is what we refer to as deep culture, that which members of their own culture are often not aware of. One of the, the foundational pioneers of, of our work you might see um, his book there in the background there where my finger is pointing, Edward T. Hall. He said something to the effect of culture is, is, is strange because it hides more than it reveals and it hides most to its own members, right? So I, as a German, only became aware of what it means to be German once I left Germany. As long as I lived in Germany and never left, my Germanness was not a thing of concern to me because everybody else around me was German as well. So that is the stuff that is outside of our conscious awareness. And that's not easily detected and, and recognized just by looking, listening, and feeling into the space. That's where somebody who intimately understands this other culture will be of great service to you. Some, somebody like a cultural coach or a trainer that can shed light on cultural aspects that are not easily recognized. Basically somebody who helps you detect the things you don't even know that you don't know. So what are some of those typical recurring roadblocks that we see in the transatlantic world or whenever we work with German culture? We see a, a different approach to risk, how much, aversion or comfort we have with the unknown. We see a difference between results-oriented work and process-driven work. We see that Germans tend to have be very focused on processes. Sure, they want results. They want the results along a certain process. That's something, a complaint or a concern that we often hear from clients. How do we communicate in a direct or in a less direct manner in that communication? Is it okay to be confrontational or is confrontation not okay? How do we build trust more based on the task and the completion of tasks or based upon how the relationship is between people? So what takes precedent, the task or the relationship? 
what's our goal definition? Do we view goals as something that's right in front of us and immediately fulfilled, so more short-term motivated? Or do we work and operate and set goals towards a long-term outcome? Do we engage with one another and communicate with one another rather informally or with more formality, with more etiquette, so to say, or a modicum of uh, respect and, and, and language that would signify or signal uh, social distance? Are we a more group-oriented society where the identity of, of people derives from belonging to several groups? Or are we more individualistic? Do we derive our identity from who we are as individuals? And how do we balance life and work? What how do we how do we structure a life? What's how do we uh, get fulfillment from life? Just from work only, or are there other aspects of life that that drive our our motivation and that drive our intrinsic satisfaction? Right? So these are often the the big big roadblocks that we see when when people work with the German speaking world. And here are a few more commonalities of more typical cultural traits that you want to be aware of. There's a desire for order and orderliness. My grandmother, um, may she rest in peace, she always said, what no must sign, order must be. Without order, there is disorder, there is chaos. That is a shared experience for many, many Germans who lived through one or two world wars in the first half of the uh, 20th century. My grandparents' generation um, and my great grandparents' generation. Um, we're not only living through those periods of, of um, uncertainty, they were also sometimes the perpetrators of horrific crimes against humanity. One of the reasons why I find myself doing this work, I cannot undo the past, I cannot make the crimes of the Nazis disappear magically, even though I wish I could. And yet, I feel a strong sense of responsibility that fostering intercultural understanding will hopefully lead to less of these types of conflicts that we keep seeing popping up across the world. This desire for order, this, this moving away from the chaos and disorder and unlawfulness of the first half of the 20th century shaped a lot of the behaviors of Germany and the German speaking world today. There's a desire for structure, for order, for predictability. Um, there was a German government up until about a year and a half ago um, whose leader was Angela Merkel. She was in office for 16 years. Some might argue that is too long for one government to be in office. And yet it is a sign for the desire for predictability that um, is visible and experienceable in Germany. It's better the devil you know or better the 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 leader that we've been seeing. Right? This desire for order often coincides with a communication style that values clarity. The outcome of communication among German speakers is the removing of ambiguity, being clear. And you see here that phrase, alles klar, literally translates to everything clear, is a symbol of or a sign of, hey, I understand what you're trying to tell me. I got it, no more question marks. Um, and I see a hand raised by Mr. Borchardt. So I see your hand being raised. It would be lovely if you have a comment or question to put it in the Q and A box, Mr. Borchardt. So that, that clarity style of communication goes along with a fairly direct approach. So we Germans will be quick to give you a no if they feel that they don't have enough information to make a decision so that they the answer would rather be no than a yes if there's not enough clarity. That no doesn't have to be a no forever. Once clarity is produced, that no might change, and it will change. Some other cultural values. Germans tend to be quite assertive, especially in the professional realm. They know what they want, and they will let you know that they want it, and they have a clear um, path for getting to what they want. They are not egotistical, or they're not um, bulldozing over you, they're simply um, stating their ask or their goals quite clearly. Again, desire for clarity. That goes along with uh, long-term planning. Germans are not easily swayed by the, uh, the, the quick, the quick short-term 
reward. They are often okay with sacrificing a short-term gain um, in order to, to get to their long-term desired outcome. You may have heard of the stereotypical um, management of time in the German speaking world, uh, managing time and, and, and expecting everybody else to manage time accordingly is something that is being valued. It doesn't mean that everybody in Germany is always punctual. Um, the trains certainly are not as punctual anymore as they used to be, but the expectation is there. There is a mutual expectation that people are being on time and respecting each other's time. We already talked about the process um, inclination of Germans or the, the sometimes even in love with processes. Many of our clients that we've been working with in the past uh, have, have experienced that hands-on. And this is one of the first things they bring to us, man, these Germans and their processes, I will it ever stop, right? So that is something that you'll find with Germans. Also a tendency to accept that there are rules that are binding for everybody, that society or an organization, a company, a group of people has a shared set of values and a shared set of rules. And there is an expectation that these rules will be adhered to and that if people disobey those rules or act against those, that every member in the group will feel entitled to hold you accountable to those rules. Some would say there is a, even public policing going on, right? I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but case in point would be crossing a, a traffic intersection as a pedestrian. You see the red light, don't walk, and you see no car coming, and you might feel inclined to cross the road on foot anyway because there is no immediate threat to you. Um, but there might be a parent or a grandparent with a child standing next to you, and they will let you know how they don't find that okay that you just broke the rule in front of a child and thereby setting an example that they don't want you to set. And so rules, Germans like to adhere to those and like everybody else to do the same. There is an old comparison that's been used in our industry and in, in psychology for, for decades, comparing coconuts and peaches. I'm not going to go into much detail here, just to give you a, a top level overview. Peach cultures are um, soft on the outside with a hard core, hard pit on the inside. There is juice, sweetness, and substance readily available and easily accessible on the outside. However, there is a hard resistance part on the inside. Coconuts, on the other hand, are hard and resistant on the outside. And the nutritious, juicy uh, value is past the hard shell. So you have the coconut milk water and you have the, the coconut nut, the meat of the coconut, so to say. So you have basically the exact opposite of access to the goods. And peach cultures are very open in their communication. They are um, willing to build trust quickly. Coconut cultures are resistant to do that and take a lot of time, energy, patience, and the right tool set in order to get through the hard outer shell. So in that comparison, Germans lean more towards being a coconut culture. Maybe not that coconut that you see here on the right on that yellow background. Maybe more the coconut you see here on the on the left side, as it falls from the coconut palm, there is a little husk around it, right? There is some material that Germans will give you to work with, but overall, there will be a limited openness to extending trust immediately. In with most German speakers, you will have to be a little bit more patient and you have to invest more into the relationship in order to get a deeper level of trust compared to that of peach cultures. Examples would be. Brazil would be the United States. Um, many Latin cultures would qualify more for a peach culture. Now, I promised you some tools to understand these uh, cultural and behavioral dynamics. One is the GlobeSmart profile that we use extensively with our clients. It compares cultures based on five dimensions and you see them listed here horizontally. You see independent versus interdependent, or you could also say individualistic versus group focused. You see here the United States heavily leaning on independent. And the other German speaking cultures, I'm only picking the top three here, they also lean more on independent, less so than the United States. And you see that Austrians 
even less so than the German speaking Swiss and the Germans. Next dimension, egalitarianism or status. We can say this is the hierarchy dimension. How much hierarchy do we find or is acceptable in these cultures? Again, you see that the United States lean more on egalitarianism as do all these four cultures we're comparing here. But the German speaking cultures are a little bit more hierarchical than the United States. Look at comfort level with risk. Here, Germany, Switzerland, Austria at the same, in the same area here around risk management, risk comfort level, a lot less risk comfortable than North Americans. Then look at communication style. Germans, Swiss Germans, very direct. Austrians, not quite as much. So here you see that not all German speakers have the same behavioral default. And then finally, the four, fifth dimension is how do we extend trust based on completion of tasks or on development of relationships? Now, I'll talk to you about coconutty culture, right? A coconutty culture will take a longer time to build that relationship. So trust needs to be developed along the task first. When the task relationship, when the task trust is there, there is a chance for the human relation trust to enter the relationship later. We can extend this a little bit. You see another book behind me here. It's uh, called The Culture Map by Erin Meyer, a book that I can highly recommend. She takes the globe smart dimensions into her framework and expands it a little bit. And you see here two levels of behaviors overlapped. You see how much confrontation is accepted in communication or avoided on the horizontal. And the vertical, you see how much emotion is expressed. On the top, it's more emotionally expressive. Here on the bottom, emotionally restrained. So you see Germany in the quadrant where it says confrontation. Sure, why not? If it serves clarity and a mutual understanding of a common truth. However, we do that in a rather emotionally restrained way. Compare that to the United States, quite less confrontational and a little bit more emotional by comparison. Look at France, Spain, Italy, Mediterranean, Western European cultures, much more emotionally expressive, also fairly okay with confrontation. Look at cultures like um, South Asia, India here, or South America, Brazil, look at East Asia, Korea, Japan, confrontation is to be avoided. And in East Asia, also with very little emotion, in India, in the Middle East, emotion, quite okay. So these are other ways to compare these behavioral traits. We can have a four quadrant comparison here around leadership as well. You see the vertical axis looks at leadership in a top down versus a consensual manner and overlapping that with hierarchical structure or egalitarian structure. Now look at this, all of the Anglo-Saxon or the biggest Anglo-Saxon cultures are in that quadrant of egalitarian, but fairly top down. So a leader does take a decision and sometimes decides over their subordinates. Then look at Germany in the opposite quadrant, a little bit more hierarchical, however, a lot more consensus driven. German leaders will most likely not make unilateral decisions against the group interest. They will try to build a broad enough consensus before they move forward with their decision. So this is how we use these tools in our training and coaching programs and help our clients get a deeper understanding that alligator underneath the water surface part of culture that you cannot see, hear, feel, that is not within the do's and don'ts. This is the underlying whys that cause the behaviors. Now, every behavior is not defined by culture. Of course, we also need to factor in human personality types. So we combine the cultural intelligence, the CQ with the emotional intelligence portion, that's EQ, right? So we use a personality profiling instrument called BANK, B-A-N-K. That's the acronym for the four archetypes in this profiling concept. You may have come across other personality profiling instruments. There is DISC and Myers-Briggs, MBTI, and, and the, I don't know, the animal stuff. And then there's many personality profiling instruments out there. I'm not making them wrong. We simply have found that 
bank works really well for our clients. It's it's easily applied and implemented with their with their team members. So we have the cultural intelligence portion, CQ and EQ for the emotional intelligence, understanding human personality, not just their culture. Because if you look at this, the, if you want to have growth in your organization and you're doing business globally, if you want to have global growth, there is a fairly simple equation. It looks maybe a little bit complicated, but bottom line is not complicated at all. So you have a certain number of business opportunities, your leads, your sales, the, the product widget service that you are marketing and selling. And those things cost, they have a per unit cost or every, every deal has a certain value. Let's say the, your average deal value times the number of opportunities or leads you have times a factor that I'll look at in a second, ice cube. So those are on the up of the, of the fraction of the, the formula. The detractor is the negative impact to that. Your growth formula will be how long it will take you to learn all this or to make those sales opportunities and create those deals and how many times you don't succeed. So you have learning curve times failure rate. Now, the critical factor in this is what we call ice Q. It's the combination of three human intelligences. So I already mentioned cultural intelligence and emotional intelligence. Add to that your IQ, your subject matter expertise, that which you're good at in your job, that which you know, right? So together we call it part for emotional intelligence, the CQ, the globe symbol for your cultural intelligence and the brain symbol for what you got up there in your subject matter expertise. So that's in combination, ISQ is a critical factor. If that is low, your global growth will be low, right? So if you can increase your ISQ, your growth will show, right? If you can even decrease the failure rate and flatten your learning curve, that will add to your growth as well. A lot of our clients and maybe some of you live in a situation where you either are sending people abroad to work or you might be the person who has been sent abroad to work. Here is a, a pie chart that I've recently shared on, on social media and some of you may have seen it and even responded to it. Um, this is the average deal or the average assignment cost for sending an expatriate, a foreign, a foreign assignee on, on a global posting. So these are random numbers. These averages are changing, of course, with inflation and over time. Um, this is a, a compilation or drawn from a, a variety of, of studies and sources from many global mobility companies and human resource departments and, and universities. So we have a lot of costs associated with sending people on a foreign assignment. And you see those factors listed here. Uh, the COLA acronym stands for cost of living adjustment uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this. And the cost of applying cultural training or coaching is minuscule in comparison to the overall cost for this assignment. So we could say this, this, this mini, mini slice of that pie is your, your risk mitigation, your, your insurance policy against assignment failure. So every, every company, every global mobility department, every human resource department uh, should answer, ask themselves that question, Do I, am I willing to risk the whole pie um, over being cheap about this one piece, right? This is this is the service that we provide to them. We we are part of the insurance policy for a lot of these global companies. Now, for those of you who are still here, um, and actually all of you are, which is fantastic. Thank you. Um, this session is only scratching the surface, right? So we are we used to do this throughout the pandemic as a live training. Now that we are able to meet again we will be having a one-day training program around this very topic, doing business with Germany and the German-speaking world, full-day training program here in Atlanta, Georgia, in our recently completed training center. So we have a brand new training room for you to, to come visit us and be with each other. That training will be held. We'll, we'll have multiple training dates throughout the year. 
The first one coming up is on March 3rd. So that's about six weeks from now. That should give everyone plenty of time to plan ahead. It will be a Friday, March the 3rd. We'll have a full day of training from morning till afternoon with interactive exercises. You will get to network with everybody who is there. And I have not made this offer public yet. You are the first group of people to become or made aware of this training program. It's posted nowhere but our website. And we just put it on a website a couple of hours ago. So the price for this going forward throughout the year will be $9.75 per person. I want to extend an offer to you because you gave me the trust of showing up here and spending time of your day. I'm only, um, we're, we're only uh, charging 800 for everybody. Your investment will only be 800 for those of you who sign up now. There is a, um, a time limit on this. By the end of January, it will go back to the original price. So this is only good for less than two weeks. And there is also a limit of seats. So we will make this available only for the first um, 20 people who sign up. We have a cap in the room. We don't want, it, it's not conducive to your learning if there's more than 20 people in the room. If it's less, it's fine as well. We don't need to have a full 20 to make it a fantastic training. We can do it with only five if we want to, but the, 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 up lim the upper limit will be 20. So you will receive an email from us with a link where you can sign up. Um, I will also, hmm, yeah, since the chat is not working properly, it may not help you to put that in the chat. I will send you an email with the link where you can sign up for this training. You can sign up as an individual. You can sign up your entire team if you would like to. If you feel like, well, we got a cohort of um, team members that might qualify for this, but we're not sure if we want them to do this training with representatives from other companies, I respect that as well. Then let's have a conversation about this. We can, of course, offer this live training for you limited to the members of your team. That is a conversation I'd be happy to have with you. This, what we're offering right now is an open enrollment course. Feel free to bring as many of your team members as you want. And if, again, if, if you feel like this would be better hosted maybe at your company site, only for your team members, then we're ready to do this as well. So look out for an email if you read, you did register for this, so you received my email. So you will receive an email from us with the registration link for this. Keep in mind, this is open for, at this price level, at this investment uh, throughout the month of January. Um, and once we go into February, it will go back to the, the standard price. So you're the, the group that hears it first now here. And as promised, this is how you get in touch with me. So there is a phone number. This is our landline. If none of us answer right away, that means we are helping other clients. So feel free to leave a voicemail or even better, send us an email. That office at email goes to everybody on the team. So we all have access to this. Even if I might not be available, somebody else is. So the office at email is, is where you can get in touch with us. Make sure it's at theculturemastery.com. Sometimes the, 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 the gets dropped by people remembering it wrong. Um, feel free to take a screenshot of this if that helps. Um, if there are no more questions in our Q&A, I would be willing to say, have a wonderful rest of your day, but let me double check in the Q&A box. So we had that question, why do Germans compare everything to Germany? I hope I answered that to somewhat of a satisfaction. Oh, yes, there was that other question. The Germany of today compared to that of 10 years ago. I agree with the person who's asking this because the person is anonymous. So I'm not really sure who's asking. The Germany of today definitely is different than the Germany of 10, 20, or 50 years ago. The Germany of today is a lot more diverse than it used to be. The Germany of today is also a lot more gender equal than it used to be, even though we still don't see as many women in leadership positions in Germany as we would see, let's say, in Sweden 
or in other parts of, of, of the Nordics or in North America. The Germany of today is um, overall a little bit more inclusive, I would argue, and a little bit more conscious of its place in the world. And yet it really, really, really strongly depends on which industry you're operating in. And it really depends on which region of Germany you're operating in. This is something that we will cover in more depth in our one day training class. Um, Germany isn't the same across the country, neither are the other German speaking parts of Europe. It de really depends on which uh, general area you're operating in, whether you are in a part that used to be the socialist East for 40 years until the reunification, you might be in a rural area of Saxony compared to let's say the bustling busyness of a Western city like Dusseldorf, you might find yourself in Berlin or you might find yourself in Stuttgart. And most people who have been to Berlin and other parts of Germany will tell you Berlin isn't Germany. Just like people will say, New York is not the United States or find any other comparison where a capital city or the biggest city of a country may not be representative of the rest of it. So it, 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 there is a, a very long multi-layered answer to your question. Thank you for this question. And yes, it, it, it has to be stated that Germany did undergo significant changes, generational changes, uh, changes through immigration, migration to the country, changes due to the um, economic embeddedment of Germany within the European Union and the role of Germany within the European Union and the changing role of Germany on the international stage. Uh, you just look at the news in the last nine months of how Germany positioned itself uh, in the context of the Russian aggression in Ukraine, right? So all of these are factors to consider and, and that's a very very smart and, and, and important question you're asking here. I'd love to answer it in much more detail as part of the, the group you will be attending March 3rd. Again. Mark your calendars, watch out for my email. You'll receive that later today with a link where you can register doing business with Germany full day here in Atlanta, or if you choose to at your location and we'll talk about this separately and we'll make it a customized program for your organization. And now we're already over time a little bit. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you for joining this session. It was wonderful to see so more see so many registered here on the list but i didn't literally see you i hope to do that soon thank you very much feel free to reach out to me with any questions you might have and i look forward to working you with you in the very near future have a wonderful rest of your day and see you again soon bye bye auf wiedersehen ciao ciao